Hey everybody, welcome to another sneak in social distancing story time. That didn't really make sense. How about let's call it a sneaky social distancing story time. The kids are at the beach. I have a little time between meetings. So I thought I would sneak in a little social distancing story time, get one in the can as they say. And then when the kids show back up from the beach, I'll have one all recorded um, since I'll be in meetings later this afternoon. And I'm gonna try a different way of doing it this time so you can see the book a little bit better and you don't have to look at me so much. Uh, and maybe the words won't be backwards if you're trying to read along. All right, so here we go. Let me flip this bad boy around. Okay, so today's first book is Harold and the Purple Crayon. We just got a bunch of new books from the Ipswich Public Library yesterday. So it's exciting to have the library back open so that we can have a bunch of new books every week. Okay, one evening, after thinking it over for some time, Harold decided to go for a walk in the moonlight. There wasn't any moon and Harold needed a moon for a walk in the moonlight and he needed something to walk on. Isn't that creative? Look, did he draw a moon? What's he gonna walk on? Let's see. He made a long straight path so he wouldn't get lost, and he set off on his walk, taking his big purple crayon with him. But he didn't seem to be getting anywhere on the long straight path, so he left the path for a shortcut across a field, and the moon went with him. Where's he going to go? The shortcut led right to where Harold thought a forest ought to be. He didn't want to get lost in the woods, so he made a very small forest with just one tree in it. Oh, there's the moon. It's still right there. It turned out to be an apple tree. Yum. The apples would be very tasty, Harold thought, when they got red. So he put a frightening dragon under the tree to guard the apples. Whoo, look at that dragon. It was a terribly frightening dragon. It even frightened Harold. He backed away. Ooh, his hand holding the purple crayon shook. Boop, 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 boop. Ah. Suddenly he realized what was happening. But by then Harold was over his head in an ocean. Oh no, Harold. He came up thinking fast. What's he drawing right there? And in no time, he was climbing aboard a trim little boat. Good idea, Harold. He quickly set sail. And the moon sailed along with him right there. After he had sailed long enough, Harold made land without much trouble. He stepped ashore on the beach, wondering where he was, I wonder. The sandy beach reminded Harold of picnics, and the thought of picnics hmm, made him hungry. So he laid out a nice, simple picnic lunch. What do you think he's going to have for lunch? Oh, there was nothing but pie. But there were all nine kinds of pie that Harold liked best. When Harold finished his picnic, there was quite a lot left. I mean, it would be hard to eat nine pies all at once by yourself, wouldn't it? He hated to see so much delicious pie go to waste. So what's he doing here? So Harold left a very hungry moose and a deserving porcupine to finish it up. And off he went looking for a hill to climb to see where he was. Harold knew that the higher up he went, the farther he could see. So he decided to make the hill into a mountain. If he went high enough, he thought he could see the windows of his bedroom. Hmm. He was tired and he felt he ought to be getting to bed. He hoped he could see his bedroom window from the top of the mountain. But as he looked down over the other side, oh no, he slipped! And there wasn't any other side of the mountain. He was falling in thin air. Oh, but luckily he kept his wits and his purple crayon. What's he drawing? Oh, he made a balloon and he grabbed onto it. And he made a basket under the balloon big enough to stand in. Good idea. He had a fine view from the balloon, but he couldn't see his window. He couldn't even see a house. So he made a house with windows. And he landed the balloon on the grass in the front yard. Hmm. Is that going to be the end of it? 
None of the windows was his window. He tried to think where his window ought to be. He made some more windows. He made a big building full of windows. He made lots of buildings full of windows. He made a whole city full of windows. But none of the windows was his window. He couldn't think where it might be. Hmm. He decided to ask a policeman. <laughs> the policeman pointed the way Harold was going anyway, but Harold thanked him. and walked along with the moon, wishing he was in his room, in his bed. Then suddenly Harold remembered. What did he remember? He remembered where his bedroom window was when there was a moon. It was always right around the moon. And then Harold made his bed. He got in it and he drew up the covers. The purple crayon dropped on the floor and Harold dropped off to sleep. Stasha said this book, Harold in the Purple Crayon, was one of her teacher's favorite books. She said her teacher, Suzanne, used to read this at nap time sometimes, and it put Stasha in a pretty tired mood last night when we read it after bedtime. All right, so we've got a seasonally inappropriate book right now. This is Ezra Jack Keats' The Snowy Day. It's an awesome book, but it's about winter time. I think that's okay, though. I'm kind of hot today. I could use a cool down thinking about the snow. How about you? One winter morning, Peter woke up and looked out the window. Snow had fallen during the night. It covered everything as far as he could see. After breakfast, he put on his snowsuit and ran outside. The snow was piled very high along the street to make a path for walking. We didn't have a lot of that this winter, at least in Massachusetts. We didn't get too much snow. Crunch, crunch, crunch. His feet sank into the snow, and he walked with his toes pointing out like this. He walked with his toes pointing in like that. It's fun to make tracks in the snow, isn't it? Then he dragged his feet slowly to make tracks. And he found something sticking out of the snow that made a new track. It was a stick. A stick that was just right for smacking a snow-covered tree. Would that make the snow all fall down? Down fell the snow, plop, on top of Peter's head. Where's he going to go now? He thought it would be fun to join the big boys in their snowball fight, but he knew he wasn't old enough. Not yet. So he made a smiling snowman. And he made angels. We love to make snow angels. He pretended he was a mountain climber. He climbed up a great, big, tall, heaping mountain of snow and slid all the way down. He picked up a handful of snow and another and then another. He packed it round and firm and put the snowball in his pocket for tomorrow. Then he went into his warm house. Uh, what do you think's going to happen? He told his mother all about his adventures while she took off his wet socks. And he thought and thought and thought about them. All those adventures. Before he got into bed, he looked in his pocket. His pocket was empty. The snowball wasn't there. He felt very sad. Do you know what happened to the snowball? Yeah, Stasha figured it out last night, too. It melted because his house is so warm. While he slept, he dreamed that the sun had melted all the snow away. But when he woke up, his dream was gone. The snow was still everywhere. New snow was falling. After breakfast, he called to his friend across the hall, and they went out together into the deep, deep snow. That's a great one. All right, let's see what's next. Oh, that's Daddy's book. We're not going to read that one. Okay, The Owl Moon. 
This is another seasonally inappropriate one. It looks like this one's in the winter too, huh? This is by Jane Yolen, illustrated by John Schoenher. And this is a really cool book. Let me turn this around really quickly. And I'll tell you, so last night we read some of these books after the girls had dinner. And when we were making some of the sounds in this book, we had the back door open. And somebody started to respond to the sounds we were making. We heard some barking from the dog next door. So listen in on this book and see if you can tell what sounds we were making that got somebody to talk back to us. Okay. It was late one winter night, long past my bedtime, when Pa and I went owling. There was no wind. The trees stood still as giant statues, and the moon was so bright the sky seemed to shine. Somewhere behind us, a train whistle blew, long and low, like a sad, sad song. You see that train right there? I could hear it through the woolen cap Pa had put down over my ears. A farm dog answered the train, and then a second dog joined in. They sang out trains and dogs for a real long time, and when their voices faded away, it was quiet as a dream. We walked on toward the woods, Pa and I. Our feet crunched over the crisp snow, and gray little footprints followed us. Pa made a long shadow, but mine was short and round. I had to run after him every now and then to keep up and my short round shadow bumped after me. But I never called out. If you go owling, you have to be quiet. That's what Pa always says. I had been waiting to go owling with Pa for a long, long time. We reached the line of pine trees, black and pointy against the sky. And Pa held up his hand. I stopped right where I was and waited. He looked up, as if searching the stars, as if reading a map up there. The moon made his face into a silver mask. Then he called, Hoo hoo! Hoo 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 hoo! The sound of the great horned owl. Hoo hoo! Hoo 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 hoo! Do you think that was the sound we were making last night? Again he called out, and then again. After each call, he was silent, and for a moment we both listened, but there was no answer. Pa shrugged, and I shrugged. I was not disappointed. My brothers all said, sometimes there's an owl and sometimes there isn't. We walked on. We could feel the cold as if someone's icy hand was palmed down on my back and on my nose and the tops of my cheek felt hot and cold at the same time. But I never said a word. If you go owling, you have to be quiet and make your own heat. We went into the woods. The shadows were the blackest thing I had ever seen. They stained the white snow. My mouth felt furry from the scarf over it. It was wet and warm. I didn't ask what kinds of things hide behind the black trees in the middle of the night. When you go owling, you have to be brave. When we came to a clearing in the woods, the moon was high above us. It seemed to fit exactly over the center of the clearing, and the snow below it was whiter than milk in a cereal bowl. I sighed and Pa held up his hand at the sound. I put my mittens over the scarf over my mouth and listened hard. Then Pa called, Hoo hoo! Hoo 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 hoo! Hoo hoo! Hoo 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 hoo! I listened and looked so hard my ears hurt, and my eyes got cloudy with the cold. Pa raised his face to call out again, but before he could open his mouth, an echo came threading its way through the trees. Hoo, 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 hoo. Pa almost smiled. Then he called back, hoo, 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 hoo. Just as if he and the owl were talking about supper or about the woods or the moon or the cold. I took my mitten off the scarf off my mouth and I almost smiled too. The owl's call came closer from high up in the trees on the edge of the meadow. Nothing in the meadow moved. All of a sudden, an owl shadow, part of the big tree shadow, lifted off. We watched silently with heat in our mouths, the heat of all those words we had not spoken. 
The shadow hooted again. Do you see the owl? I did a bad job zooming in before, sorry. <laughs> pa turned on his big flashlight and caught the owl just as it was landing on a branch. For one minute, three minutes, maybe even a hundred minutes, we stared at one another. Then the owl pumped its great wings and lifted off the branch like a shadow without a sound. It flew back into the forest. Time to go home, Pa said to me. I knew then I could talk. I could even laugh out loud. But I was a shadow as we walked home. When you go owling, you don't need words or warm or anything but hope. That's what Pa says. The kind of hope that flies on silent wings under a shining owl moon. Cool story, huh? All right, one more winter book before we get out of the wrong season. This one is Brave Irene by William Stieg. Mrs. Bobbin, the dressmaker, was tired and had a bad headache, but she still managed to sew the last stitches of the oops of the gown she was making. It's the most beautiful dress in the whole world, said her daughter, Irene. The Duchess will love it. It is nice, her mother admitted, but Dumpling, it's for tonight's ball, and I don't have the strength to bring it. I feel sick. Poor Mama, said Irene. I can get it there. No, Cupcake, I can't let you, said Mrs. Bobbin. Such a huge package, and it's such a long way to the palace. Besides, it's starting to snow. But I love snow, Irene insisted. She coaxed her mother into the bed, covered her with two quilts, and added a blanket for her feet. Then she fixed her some tea with lemon and honey and put more wood in the stove. With great care, Irene took the splendid gown down from the dummy and packed it in a big box with plenty of tissue paper. Dress warmly, pudding, her mother called out in a weak voice, and don't forget to button up. It's cold out there and windy. Irene put on her fleece-lined boots, her red hat and muffler, her heavy coat, and her mittens. She kissed her mother's hot forehead six times. Then once again, made sure she was tucked in snugly and slipped out with the big box, shutting the door firmly behind her. It really was cold outside, the wind whirling, the falling snowflakes about this way, that way, and into Irene's squinting face. She set out on the uphill path to Farmer Bennett's sheep pasture. By the time she got there, the snow was up to her ankles and the wind was worse. It hurried her along and made her stumble. Irene resented this. The box was problem enough. Easy does it, she cautioned the wind, leaning back hard against it. By the middle of the pasture, the flakes were falling thicker. Now the wind drove Irene along so rudely she had to hop, skip, and go into helter-skeltering over the knobby ground. Cold snow sifted into her boots and chilled her feet. She pushed out her lip and hurried on. This was an important errand. When she reached Apple Road, the wind decided to put on a show. It ripped branches from trees and flung them about, swept up and scattered the fallen snow, got in front of Irene to keep her from moving ahead. Irene turned around and pressed on backwards. Go home, the wind squalled. Irene, go home! I will do no such thing, she snapped. No such thing, you wicked wind. Go home, the wind shouted. Go home, it shrieked, or else. For a short second, Irene wondered if she shouldn't heed the wind's warning, but no. The gown had to get to the Duchess. The wind wrestled her for the package, walloped it, twisted it, shook it, snatched at it, but Irene wouldn't yield. It's my mother's work, she screamed. Then, ho, ho, the box was wrenched from her mittened grasp and sent bumping along in the snow. Irene went after it. She pounced and took hold, but the ill-tempered wind ripped the box open. The ball gown flounced out and went waltzing through the powdered air with tissue paper attendants. Oh, no. Irene clung to the empty box and watched the beautiful gown disappear. How could anything so terribly wrong be allowed to happen? Tears froze on her lashes. Her dear mother's hard work, all those days of measuring, cutting, pinning, stitching for this? And the poor Duchess. Irene decided she would have to trudge on with just the box and explain everything in person. Hmm. 
She went shuffling through the snow. Would her mother understand, she wondered, that it was the wind's fault, not hers? Would the Duchess be angry? The wind was howling like a wild animal. Suddenly, Irene stepped in a hole and fell over with a twisted ankle. She blamed it on the wind. Keep quiet, she scolded. You've done enough damage already. You've spoiled everything. Everything! The wind swallowed up her words. She sat in the snow in great pain, afraid she wouldn't be able to go on. But she managed to get to her feet and start moving. It hurt. Home, where she longed to be, where she and her mother would be warm together, was far behind. It's got to be closer to the palace, she thought. But where any place was in all this snow, she couldn't be sure. She plowed on, dragging furrows with her sore foot. The short winter day was almost done. Am I still going the right way, she wondered. There was no one around to advise her. Whoever else there was in this snow-covered world was far, far away and safe indoors, even the animals in their burrows. She went plodding on. Soon, night took over. She knew in the dark that the muffled snow was still falling. She could feel it. She was cold and alone in the middle of nowhere. Irene was lost. She had to keep moving. She was hoping she'd come to a house, any house at all, and be taken in. She badly needed to be in someone's arms. The snow was above her knees now. She shoved her way through it, clutching the empty box. She was asking how long a small person could keep this struggle up when she realized it was getting lighter. There was a soft glow coming from somewhere below her. Oh! She waded toward this glow and soon was gazing down a long slope at a brightly lit mansion. It had to be the palace. Irene pushed forward with all her strength and slosh, slump. She plunged downward and was buried. She had fallen off a little cliff. Only her hat and the box in her hands stuck out above the snow. Even if she could call for help, no one would hear her. Her body shook, her teeth chattered. She would not freeze to death, she, shot, she thought, and let all these troubles end. Oh, wait, just kidding, that's not what it says. Why not freeze to death, she thought, and let all these troubles end? Why not? She was already buried. And never see her mother's face again? Her good mother, who smelled like fresh-baked bread? In an explosion of fury, she flung her body about to free herself and was finally able to climb up on her knees and look around. How to get down to the glittering palace? As hmm. soon as she raised the question, she had the answer. She laid the box down and climbed aboard. But it pressed into the snow and stuck. She tried again, and this time, instead of climbing on, she leaped. The box shot forward like a sled. The wind raced after Irene, but couldn't keep up. In a moment, she would be with people again inside where it was warm. The sled slowed and jerked to a stop on paving stones. The time had come to break the bad news to the Duchess. With the empty box clasped to her chest, Irene strode nervously toward the palace. <gasps> but then her feet stopped moving and her mouth fell open. What's that? She stared. Maybe this was impossible, yet there it was, a little way off and over to the right, hugging the trunk of a tree, the beautiful ball gown. The wind was holding it there. Mama, Irene shouted, Mama, I found it. She managed somehow, despite the wind's meddling, to get the gown off the tree and back into its box. And in another moment, she was at the door of the palace. And in another moment, she knocked twice with the big brass knocker. The door opened and she burst in. She was welcomed by cheering servants and a delirious duchess. They couldn't believe she had come over the mountain in such a storm, all by herself. She had to tell the whole story, every detail, and she did. Then she asked to be taken right back to her sick mother. But it was out of the question, they said. The road that ran around the mountain wouldn't be cleared till morning. Don't fret, child, said the duchess. Your mother is surely sleeping now. We'll get you there first thing in the morning. Irene was given a good dinner as she sat by the fire, the moisture steaming off her clothes. The duchess, meanwhile, got into her freshly ironed gown before the guests began arriving in their sleighs. What a wonderful ball it was. The duchess in her new gown was like a bright star in the sky. Irene in her ordinary dress was radiant. She was swept up into dances by handsome aristocrats who kept her feet off the floor to spare her ankle. Her mother would enjoy hearing about it all. Early the next morning, when the snow had long since ceased falling, Mrs. Bobbin awoke from a good night's sleep feeling much improved. She hurried about and got a fire going in the cold stove. Then she went to look in on Irene. 
but Irene's bed was empty. She ran to the window and gazed at the white landscape. No one out there. Snow powder fell from the branch of a tree. Where is my child? Mrs. Bobbin cried. She whipped on her coat to go out and find her. When she pulled the door open, a wall of drift faced her. But peering over it, she could see a horse-drawn sleigh hastening up the path, and seated on the sleigh between two large footmen was Irene herself, asleep but smiling. Would you like to hear the rest? Well, there was a bearded doctor at the back of the sleigh, and the Duchess had sent Irene's mother a ginger cake with white icing, some oranges, and a pineapple, and spice candy of many flavors, along with a note saying how much she cherished her gown, and what a brave, loving person Irene was, which, of course, Mrs. Bobbin knew better than the Duchess. All right, let's read one last story. This one is The Day the Crayons Quit by Drew Daywalt. Pictures by Oliver Jeffers. We used to love reading this book. It was in the playroom of our old building when we lived in New York. I'm not even sure if Stasha remembers that we used to read it. One day in class, Duncan went to take out his crayons and found a stack of letters with his name on it. To Duncan. Hmm. Hey, Duncan, it's me, Red Crayon. We need to talk. You make me work harder than any of your other crayons. All year long, I wear myself out coloring fire engines, apples, strawberries, and everything else that's red. I even work on holidays. I have to color all the Santas at Christmas, all the hearts on Valentine's Day. I need a rest. Your overworked friend, Red Crayon. Hmm. Those are a lot of things Red has to draw. Dear Duncan, all right, listen. I love that I am your favorite crayon for grapes, dragons, and wizards hats. But it makes me crazy that so much of my gorgeous color goes outside the lines. Hmm. If you don't start coloring inside the lines soon, I'm going to completely lose it. Your very neat friend, Purple Crayon. I mean, that's kind of mean, Purple. Dear Duncan, I'm tired of being called light brown or dark tan because I am neither. I'm beige, and I am proud. I'm also tired of being second place to Mr. Brown Crayon. It's not fair that brown gets all the bears, ponies, and puppies. Well, the only things I get are turkey dinners, if I'm lucky, and wheat. And let's be honest, when was the last time you saw a kid excited about coloring wheat? Your beige friend. Beige Crayon. Duncan. Gray Crayon here. You're killing me. Whoop. I know you love elephants. And I know that elephants are gray. But that's a lot of space to color in all by myself. And don't even get me started on your rhinos, hippos, and humpback whales. You know how tired I am after handling all of those things? Such big animals. Baby penguins are gray, you know. So are very tiny rocks. Pebbles. How about one of those once in a while to give me a break? You're very tired, friend. Gray crayon. Dear Duncan, you color with me, but why? Most of the time I'm the same color as the page you are using me on. Boop. White. If I didn't have a black outline, you wouldn't even know I was there. I'm not even in the rainbow. I'm only used to color snow or to fill in empty space between other things. And it leaves me feeling, well, empty. We need to talk. Your empty friend, White Crayon. White Cat in the Snow by Duncan. Hmm. Dear Duncan, I hate being used to draw the outline of things. Things that are colored in by other colors, all of which think they're brighter than me. It's not fair. When you use me to draw a nice beach ball and then fill in the colors of the ball with all the other crayons, how about a black beach ball sometimes? Is that too much to ask? Your friend, Black Crayon. Dear Duncan, as Green Crayon, I am writing for two reasons. One is to say that I like my work. Loads of crocodiles, trees, dinosaurs, and frogs. I have no problems and wish to congratulate you on a very successful coloring things green career so far. 
The second reason I write is for my friends Yellow Crayon and Orange Crayon, who are no longer speaking to each other. Both crayons feel they should be the color of the sun. Hmm. Please settle this soon because you're driving the rest of us crazy. Your happy friend, Green Crayon. Dear Duncan, Yellow Crayon here. I need to tell you, I need to tell, I need you to tell Orange Crayon that I am the color of the sun. I would tell him, but we are no longer speaking. And I can prove I'm the color of the sun, too. Last Tuesday, you used me to color in the sun on your happy farm coloring. In case you've forgotten, it's on page 7. You can't miss me. I'm shining down brilliantly on a field of yellow corn. Your pal and the true color of the sun, yellow crayon. Dear Duncan, I see yellow crayon already talked to you. The big whiner. Anyway, could you please tell Mr. Tattletail that he is not the color of the sun? I would, but we're no longer speaking. We both know I am clearly the color of the sun because on Thursday, you used me to color in the sun on both the Monkey Island and Meet the Zookeeper pages on your book. Orange, you glad I'm here? Ha! <laughs> your pal and the real color of the sun, Orange Crayon. Are you guys seeing a pattern here? I am. A lot of complaining. Dear Duncan, it has been great being your favorite color this past year and the year before and the year before that. I have really enjoyed all those oceans, lakes, rivers, raindrops, rain clouds, and clear skies. But the bad news is that I am so short and stubby, I can't even see over the railing in the crayon box anymore. I need a break. Your very stubby friend, Blue Crayon. Duncan. All right, listen here, kid. You have not used me once in the past year. It's because you think I'm a girl color, isn't it? Speaking of which, please tell your little sister, I said thank you for using me to color in her little princess coloring book. I think she did a fabulous job of staying inside the lines. Now, back to us. Could you please use me sometime to color the occasional pink dinosaur? or monster, or cowboy. Goodness knows they could use a splash of color. Your unused friend, Pink Crayon. Dear Duncan, it's me, Peach Crayon. Why did you peel off my paper wrapping? Now I'm naked and too embarrassed to leave the crayon box. I don't even have any underwear. How would you like it to go to school naked? I need some clothes. Help. Your naked friend, Peach Crayon. Well, poor Duncan wanted to color, and of course he wanted his crayons to be happy, so that gave him an idea. When Duncan showed his teacher his new picture, she gave him an A for coloring. Wow, look at all that color. Have you ever seen so many cool things in one illustration, in one drawing? Do you guys like to draw pictures like that? Yeah, that's a pretty awesome drawing. And an A plus for creativity. Nice. All right, guys. That's our sneaky social distancing story time for the day today. Thanks for joining us. We'll sneak another one in again soon. Bye.